Good morning. I'm Micah. Um, please stand for the reading of the word. All right, this is Luke chapter 6, starting in verse 27. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who, who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. Whoever hits you on the cheek, offer him the other also. And whoever takes away your coat, do not withhold your shirt from him either. Give to everyone who asks of you. And whoever takes away what is yours, do not demand it back. Treat others the same way you want them to treat you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right, you guys have a seat. The questions Jesus asked a series, I don't know about you guys, but man, it's such a a kind of a humbling thing, right, to walk through the Gospels and see Jesus live his life and teach the things that he teaches. And um, it's such a simple idea of a series, but as we look at the questions he asks so many, to hundreds of questions in the Gospels that Jesus uses to teach us, right? Um, man, just how it kind of, I don't know, just sobers us a little bit and kind of centers us on the things and the ways that he wants us to live our lives as we, as we treat people a certain way, as we think about people even a certain way. And Jesus constantly in his ministry just shows us what that looks like, right? Shows us what it looks like to treat people the way that God wants them to be treated. And, and it comes to sometimes like a teaching like this where it comes down to maybe people that we don't get along with or people that have actually hurt us whether by just neglect or by some sort of persecution because of our faith or Man, sometimes it's a person that we know and we love and we trust who just has abused that trust, misused that trust in that relationship and has just hurt us, whether by, again, by sort of a ignorance or by intentionality. And that's why as we read uh, passages like this, I know for every one of us in this room, there's things in our minds, right, about those people in our lives, specifically for your life. Who are these people? for you that you might consider to be an enemy. Jesus t- says, you know, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Do you have enemies? Do you have people that you just cannot stand in life? Like, I, I think, can we be honest in church and talk about this? That sometimes there's people we just don't like. There's people in this world that I struggle to like and that you struggle to like. And there's people in this world that have hurt us and have done things to us that, and listen, as we go through this message today, I don't, I don't want you to hear in any way me or Jesus minimizing that truth, that reality, because it's true. It's absolutely true. And yet, I, th- I think the heart of Jesus' question to us this morning is this. What makes a person worthy of our love? What makes a person worthy of forgiveness? What makes a person worthy of mercy? you and I tend to kind of live in one of two places when it comes to that, to answer that question. When it comes to me thinking about what makes a person worthy of mercy from me, it's either one, how I feel about that person, or it's two, how that person has treated me, right? Maybe one of those two things makes them worthy of it. And so if they've treated me well, if they've treated me a certain way that kind of meets my criteria for how I should be treated, then yeah, I'm going to treat them that same way. And Jesus talks about this, like, what credit is it to you if you treat people like that who love you and have treated you well, and so you love them and treat them well? Everybody does that. Or maybe it's just how I feel about them, right? And look, sort of my, my, my subjective feelings and opinions about that person, like that's the basis on which I stand when I think about how I'm going to treat them. It's based on my feelings towards them. But you and I both know feelings are fickle things, right? They come and they go. And so what do we stand on? What do we stand on when it comes to how I treat another human being in this world? So let me read that that passage again. I'm going to start in verse uh, 32, actually. I'm going to kind of read the rest of it where Micah left off. Luke 6, 32. By the way, we're going to go to Matthew 18 here in a second, and then we're going to go to Ephesians 2 if you want to look in your Bibles. So Luke 6, 32 he says, If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners, expecting to be repaid in full. But, here's Jesus teaching, love your enemies. Do good to them, lend to them without expecting anything back. Then your reward will be great. 
and you will be sons of the Most High, because He is the kind, because He is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Here, here's the key verse today, verse 36. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Merciful. Be merciful. Everybody just say that word with me, merciful. Say that. Merciful. Mercy. Be merciful as your Father is merciful. What's the foundation? What, what is the place that we stand on when we think about how I treat other people? Here's the answer. It's the mercy of God. That's where we stand. Not my subjective opinions, not what they've done or not done. The mercy of God. Man, so let's go over to Matthew 18 because I want us to see Jesus sort of illustrate this truth in a parable this morning. It says Matthew chapter 18. Jesus tells Peter, I'm actually not going to read, but I want you to kind of see it in your Bible so you can kind of look through it uh, as I tell the story. So Peter comes up to Jesus one day and he asks Jesus in Matthew 18, he says, Jesus, how, how often should I forgive my brother if they sin against me? And he says, should I do it seven times, Jesus? Because Peter's given a number that's like, that's a pretty good number. The rabbis generally taught three times. That was the teaching of the day. So Peter says, let's double that, add one seven times. Jesus like, pat on the back for me, Peter, I got the right answer. And Jesus says, no, Peter, 70 times seven. Like Jesus is kind of just taking his number and going, you know what the reality is, the answer is, you never are give, you're never allowed to get off the hook as a person following Jesus to not forgive someone. You're never allowed off that hook of forgiveness. Our, our, our forgiveness is not based on what we think or how we feel or what they did. And so Jesus tells a parable. He tells a parable of a servant who owes money to a king. It says he owes this king 10,000 talents, and the king forgives that debt. 10,000 talents, and the king forgives it. And then after that servant has been forgiven that debt of 10,000 talents, he runs out and he finds another servant, one of his fellow servants, who owes him 100 denarii. And he strangles that servant. He demands that that servant pay him back the money that he is owed. And then some other servants see this going on and they run back to the king and they go, king, that servant that you just forgave, 10,000 talents, he's now out there choking somebody out because he owes him a hundred denarii. And the king's like, bring that guy back into me. So he brings him back in and then the king punishes him. He's like, man, you don't, you don't understand what just happened to you? You don't understand the debt I just forgave for you? And now you're out there choking out your brother because he owes you a hundred denarii. Jesus tells this parable to kind of give us this contrast. Because listen, when you read parables, by the way, in the Bible, when Jesus speaks in parables, and he does often, when you read parables, we always need to pay attention to the contrasts that he gives in the parable, right? You know the parable like the prodigal son? Contrast between like the one son and the other son, right? Like one son is one way, the other son is another way. Or the parable of the soils, right? Where there's certain kinds of soil. He's contrasting types of soils, right? In this parable, in Matthew 18, what is Jesus contrasting? He's contrasting the debts more than anything, all right? There's a contrast between kings and servants, but there's really the biggest contrast in Matthew 18 is the contrast between one debt that is owed and another debt that is owed. Jesus said the one servant owed the king how much? 10,000 talents. You know how much one talent is? 20 years of wages. That's one talent. 10,000 talents is 200,000 years of wages, that's how much this servant owed to the king. And then a hundred denarii, that's about a hundred days wages, right? So a denarii is one day, a hundred days wages. Let's put, it, let's put this in American 21st century terms, okay? A hundred denarii to us would be about 10,000 bucks. Somebody owes you 10,000 bucks. Is that a decent amount of debt? Uh, yeah, that's pretty good, right? Like, that's pretty big. If somebody owed you, ten, you lent somebody 10,000 bucks and they owed it to you and refused to pay it back. Like that would hurt a little bit to most of us anyway. That would sting, right? That'd be a hard debt to, to, to forget about. It's like, man, you owe me 10,000 bucks. But here's the contrast. Again, 10,000 talents versus that. So 10,000 talents in our society, in our culture, would be about $7.6 billion. That's how much the servant owed to the king. 100 denarii versus 10,000 talents. $10,000-ish, 100 denarii versus $7.6 billion dollars. Let's, let's think about these things in sort of the contrast of them. If you were to weigh out, if you were to weigh out $10,000 in $1 bills, it would weigh like 20 pounds. $10,000 in ones weigh about 20 pounds. If you were to weigh out $7.6 billion in $1 bills, it would weigh 16 million pounds. 
That would be the difference between a beagle and the Eiffel Tower. Here's, here's a picture of this. I don't know if that's a beagle. It might be, but that's the Eiffel Tower. This is the difference. This is the contrast Jesus is making between the debts that are owed, the one servant to the king and the other servant to the other servant. Let's put this in terms of height. If you were to stack up $1 bills, $10,000 high would be about four feet high. If you were to stack up $7.6 billion of $1 bills, it would go twice as far as the International Space Station. That's the difference in the debt. Does anybody see four feet of dollar bills on there? No. But you can see 500, it would be 500 miles of one dollar bills. By the way, that puts in perspective how much a billion dollars is, does it not? 7.6 billion dollars would go 500 miles off the earth, twice as far as the International Space Station. That's crazy. Jesus is making a point. These things are not the same. These debts are not even close. Again, $10,000 of debt, y'all, that's, that's a good amount of debt. We understand that. We feel that. But in comparison with the debt that is owed to the king, and Jesus is like just asking us to hear this story and put ourselves in the place of this servant. Yes, there are other servants who owe us $10,000. That may be true. There are others who have hurt us, who have spoken against us, who have sinned against us, who have abused their right to be in relationship with us. That, that, all of that stuff is true. But when we think about our relationship to God, our king, and the debt that we owe to him, there's really no comparison. Remember this. Some sins happen against you. Every sin happens against God. Every one of them. And Jesus told that parable because when, G when Peter asked, how much should I forgive somebody, right? Like it's one thing for Jesus just to say 70 times, seven, just forgive people all the time. But it's another thing to tell Peter and tell, tell us why. Like what's the foundation that we stand on in order to forgive someone every single time? In order to, or not even just forgiveness, but just to see people with mercy, see people with compassion. Because some of us are maybe just judgmental sometimes. We just don't even give people the benefit of the doubt in our lives. Where can we stand in order to see people in a different light? Jesus doesn't just say, forgive them, love them, have compassion on them. He tells this story to make the point there's a debt that you owe to the king. Do you understand what you've been forgiven of? If you do, that will change the way in which your heart then responds to people who need your forgiveness or who need your mercy, who need your grace, who need your compassion, who need your love. The Apostle Paul, so Ephesians 2, flip over to Ephesians 2 with me. The Apostle Paul puts it this way. Think about debt, right? So again, what is this debt? What is this, what is this 10,000 talents? What is this Eiffel Tower? That's 16 million pounds, by the way. What is this 16 million pounds of weight crushing down on us? What is this 500 miles of debt that is stacked up on our shoulders? What is it? The Apostle Paul answers Ephesians chapter 2. He says this, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Transgressions and sins is just Paul's way of saying every, th every part of our lives that is fallen short of the glory of God. Transgressions and sins would be two different ways of kind of saying transgressions are like willful disobedience and sins are like ignorant un inability, right? So willful disobedience and ignorant inability. No matter what you do, we cannot in our sinful nature please God. You can't do it. The debt just stacks up. It just piles up all throughout our lives. We are dead. He says we're dead in that. As we stand, like that Eiffel Tower is just crushing us down and your debt, like the debt cannot be not even just paid. It can't be understood by you. Like, do you get the, the, the relationship that Jesus is giving us to our debt in that parable and that Paul is showing us here? It's not just that you can't pay back the debt. You can't even understand. You can't fathom this debt. This is a debt that is beyond your ability to understand, let alone repay to the king. Dead in transgressions and sins. He says, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. Just in our sinful nature, apart from faith in Jesus, man, we're just submitted to the devil. That, that's who we are. Jesus talks to the Pharisees like this. Your father is the devil. 
Because that's who you're submitted to. That's who you're following in the lusts of your flesh and your greediness and your pride and all the debt that you're stacking up against God. It's just because you're submitted to the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. He says, all of us also lived among them at one time. He's talking about, if you're not a Christian, this is who you are. This is where you are. And if you are a Christian, this is where you were. He just wants us to be reminded of this. He says, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. Other translations say children, children of wrath. What is the inheritance? What is the, like, that's what children get, right? What is the inheritance of the children who are disobedient to God, who have no faith in Jesus Christ? What is their inheritance? Wrath. Like that's, that's the weight, right? That's that Eiffel Tower weight. That's that 500 miles of death. Like that's what Paul is getting at here. When Jesus was telling that parable, he was just trying to help us see you're dead apart from Jesus. The debt that you owe cannot be paid nor even comprehended by us because we're completely and utterly children of wrath, dead in our sins. But, verse four, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith and this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. I should have heard some amens to that because that is the good news of the gospel. Debt upon debt upon debt upon debt upon debt upon debt upon debt that can never be paid by you. But, he said, because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy. Did you know God was rich in mercy? You know God's rich? We have debt. God is rich. You and I are just debtors woefully in debt, and yet he is rich in mercy. Guys, by the way, this is why as Christians, this is why we sing. You know other religions don't really sing like Christians do, right? Christians sing. You know why? Because they have rituals, they have regulations, they have rules, they have religion. We have riches. That's why we sing. You don't sing for religious sake. You sing for riches because mercy has come to us who are debtors in our sins. And because he has riches, riches of mercy. And he says, riches of grace in verse seven. Man, we are saved by that grace, made free and clean and forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ. You know, the blood of Jesus is the currency of God's mercy. And that's how we are free. That's the parable Jesus told. That king looking at that servant and saying, 10,000 talents, free. Debt paid, go. And so how it would grieve the heart of that king to then hear that a servant of his, put yourself there in that servant's place, that a servant of his would then go out and refuse mercy to someone else. How that must grieve the heart of God. If we are unmerciful, we who have received such mercy from him. And so, going back to Luke 6, Jesus says, very simply, he says, be merciful just as your father is merciful. What is the foundation we stand on when we think about other people in our lives? Is it how I feel about them? Is it how they've treated me or not treated me, what they've done, what they haven't done? No. 
What's the foundation we stand on? It's the mercy of God. Do you understand this morning the mercy that God has had upon your life to save you from death, to save you from hell, to save you from his own wrath and from the weight, the crushing weight of the debt that you owe to him? Listen, if we are people who are unwilling to show mercy, who are unwilling to forgive, then we are making it clear that one, we have either not received forgiveness ourselves, not received mercy ourselves, or we have received it, we just think we earned it and they haven't. In which case, you don't understand mercy. You don't understand the grace of God. You don't understand the cross of Jesus Christ if you refuse mercy to a brother or a sister. So again, I, I want to make this clear. I am not saying, Jesus is not saying, no one is saying that what they did, with that person that you have in your mind, as I've been going through this sermon, because you got somebody in your mind probably, nobody's saying that what they did is excusable. Nobody's saying what they did was right. Nobody's saying it didn't hurt. Nobody's saying it wasn't absolutely horrible horrible. Nobody's saying it, it, it won't involve some real time and healing and intentionality to maybe repair that relationship, maybe reconcile, maybe not even that's possible. I don't know. But none of that really is the whole point. The whole point is be merciful as your father is merciful. And Jesus actually says in Matthew 5, He's talking about when we enter into worship in the sanctuary. And he says this, he says, if you come to worship and there you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, basically to say, if you remember that, that you're at odds with somebody else, he says, leave your gift, go be reconciled, and then come worship. That's not God saying, I don't want your worship. That's God saying, I do want your worship. And if you come to me with a divided heart because there's no reconciliation there, you're going to have a hard time worshiping me anyway. Man, so leave your gift and do what you need to do in your heart and your mind. And if possible, even to reach out to a person, offer forgiveness, receive forgiveness, make it right if it's possible. If it's not possible, at least bring it to the Lord and let your heart be undivided before him. I, th I think it's probably true in this room that at least most of us, if you're following Jesus, you want to bear fruit for his kingdom, right? Can you just nod your head if you do? Like, do you want to bear fruit for the kingdom of God? Do you want to be a good and faithful servant of Jesus? you want to bear fruit? Listen, you know what the enemy of fruit is? Bitterness. It's the enemy of fruit. And this one issue, y'all, I'm just... It's just to be real and honest right now, this one issue right here will keep many people from bearing fruit for the kingdom of God in their lives. Bitterness, anger, unmercifulness, unforgiveness, judgmentalism in your heart. And if you're unwilling to bring that to the Father, and like Jesus said, to lay that at the altar before him, man, then you're, you're always going to be hindered in your ability to worship him and to love people and to be a gospel witness in this world. And the call and the invitation this morning is, man, if you see the mercy that he's given you, taken off your shoulders by the blood of Jesus, would you please then be willing in humility just to go offer that back to somebody else? Look, maybe you don't even struggle with this this morning, but there may be a time coming in your life where you will because somebody's going to hurt you. But I want you to remember this too, that of all the people in the world who have hurt you, of all the people in the world who have let you down, of all the people in the world who have lied to you, who have frustrated you, who have betrayed you, you know who's done that more than anybody else? You. And Jesus forgave you for hurting you 
Would we stand and tell Jesus that our forgiveness is worth more than his? Again, I just, I cannot imagine something that might grieve his heart more than that. And I can't imagine something that would please the father more than to see his children be like his son because you can't be more like Jesus than when you forgive somebody. You can't be. You can't be more like Jesus than when you show mercy. You can't be more like Jesus than when you have compassion and love and grace for your fellow man, your brother or sister, especially your brothers and sisters in Christ, but even to those who aren't. Is that not the very center of who he is? Forgiveness and mercy and compassion. That's who he is. We can't be more like him than when we're just doing those things too. So if you would, just bow your heads with me this morning. Bow your heads and just close your eyes with me. I just want to kind of lead us in prayer. And I want you just for a second to think with me about your own sins. I know we do this in communion and I just want us to kind of have a moment where we think intentionally about just the ways that we have built up debt towards God. What are the sins in your life? What are the things in your life that you fail to glorify God in? And we all have these debts. We all have these sins and transgressions that Paul talked about that we are dead in if we don't know Jesus. But, man, if you're a follower of Christ this morning, I just want you, as you think about those things, to right now in your heart, just lay them at the foot of the cross. And I want you to remember Jesus' own words in John chapter 19, when he said, dying on the cross, he said the word in Greek, to telestai, it is finished. That word literally means the debt is paid. That all that debt, all those things that you can think about for yourself, all the ways that you fall short of the glory of God, those things are paid for. And now as you think about that, I want you to think about that other person. Is, is there somebody in your life, just have a name in your mind, maybe picture their face, just think about them for a second. Is there somebody in your life that you have something against? Somebody in your life that you're struggling to forgive? Somebody in your life that maybe you've just been judgmental towards? Or maybe they've been judgmental towards you? Or maybe there's just unresolved issues? Or maybe you're just bitter. Maybe you can't even talk to that person anymore. There's no way to, but maybe you just feel angry. Here's what I would offer you just as we bow our heads. Man, whatever it is that that person has done or whatever it is that stands between you two, I, I want you right now just to cling to the mercy of Jesus because that's the only thing you have. Your feelings won't do it. Whether or not they say they're sorry won't fix it. But God's mercy can change your heart to make you merciful. So would you just stand there and cling to that right now? I just want to give you a second just to think and just to pray. God, let your mercy come and soften our hearts. God, I pray that your mercy would change us this morning. Let us be free of the burdens of bitterness. Let us be free of the mire of unmercifulness on our hearts. Let us be free of the weight of judgmentalism. Let us see your mercy for what it is. Stand on it with joy and humility and freedom. Let us be free, free from the debt that we owe and so free to give what we have received. Mercy and grace. In Jesus' name, amen. So as we sing now, Here's what I want to offer you. Like Jesus said, maybe some of us in this room, we actually need to come and lay our gift at the altar because we know we're still holding that thing. I'm going to hang out down here. Um, if anybody on the prayer team wants to come down here, we would love to pray with you. 
If you don't want anybody to pray with you, that's fine too. Just kneel and come pray. Man, if you just need to, I'm just, I think sometimes it's just important to move, right? Just to allow the Lord to work as we move and just go, you know what, God, I'm surrendering this bitterness to you. So I want to ask you if you would do that or if you just want to stay at your chair, stay in your seats and pray and give that to the Lord. And if you this morning with unencumbered heart can stand and sing to the Lord, then do that too. But just let this be a time of worship, a time of trusting the Lord and obedience. Listen, obedience to the Lord as he's called us to be merciful as our Father is merciful.